It's time to get educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. This is The Dr. Duke Show. Hey, how you doing out there? Welcome everyone to The Dr. Duke Show. We have a really great show for you today. So share button, share button, hit that share button. Today's show is sponsored by Mike Lindell and our friends at MyPillow. And boy, this is so sweet. This week is MyPillow Dog Beds. You can get a beautiful plush bed for your best bestie friend ever. And just $20, 20 bucks. That is a 50% markdown when you use the access code Dr. Duke, D-R-D-U-K-E. Nothing, and I mean nothing is better than taking care of those pups who love you unconditionally. And so please help. Help, you help Mike Lindell, Mike Lindell will help us, and we're all gonna give our dogs a really good place to lay down. Today we start with a Washington Post writer who is also an academic, there's your link, saying the quiet part out loud, which is that most progressives actually believe that the concept of individual freedom when used to support conservative causes is a key component of white supremacy. Yes, you got that right. Things like individualism, professionalism, as we're going to see, uh, they're all marks now of white supremacy. So pretty much anything that gave rise to the success of Western culture over the last 2,000 year, years, individuality, hard work, that Protestant worth at work ethic, um, individuality, the ability to be creating of your own, looking after your own family, being responsible for yourself, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, all that stuff that made Western culture supremacist in terms of its ability to create civilization, now is racist. Well, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, it's physically impossible, according to the representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Anyway, let's go back to someone who apparently is in the AOC type camp, and that is Taylor Dysart, Dysart, doesn't matter what her last name is. She's the one who wrote this WAPO opinion op-ed called the Ottawa Trucker Convoy is rooted in Canada's settler colonial history. And of course, Taylor's a PhD candidate in the Department of History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania. And Taylor felt like she needed to make the argument about how, you know, one's entitlement to freedom is a key component of white supremacy. Thank you, Taylor. You're so insightful. And then, obviously, blahdy, 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 writes all about all these good, good things. Well, according to what uh, Dysart, Dysart says, the primarily white supporters of the Freedom Convoy, because obviously only it's just, you know, white people who care about freedom, in her mind, argue that pandemic mandates infringe upon their constitutional rights to freedom. And the notion of freedom, and now we're getting air quotes in here, was historically and remains intertwined with whiteness. Oh, okay. Well, sure, but that doesn't mean that everyone can't enjoy it now, here, 2022, freedom? No, no, not according to Dysart. Well, the belief that one's entitlement to freedom is a key component of white supremacy, which you try and reread that and understand what it says. But anyway, this explains why the Freedom Convoy members see themselves as entitled to freedom, no matter the public health consequences to those around them. Ah, because it's always about not the people who want freedom for all, it's just that group that wants, apparently, their health consequences. And I know I just read an article about how ever since that Freedom Convoy in the trucker sounds, they just haven't been able to sleep because they just hear the honking. They've been traumatized, traumatized well, by what happened there in Canada. Progressive Canadians are arguing that the honking of a car of a truck horn now is a nonverbal way of saying Heil Hitler. That's what they hear, these poor, traumatized, woke Canadian snowflakes with their maple syrup and their Bob McKenzie's. What do they hear when a truck horn goes off now in their, their worst dreams, nightmares? They hear Heil Hitler. In Ottawa, various reports captured maskless protesters, were told, brandishing Confederate Nazi and Trump 24 flags. I love this. So white supremacy and Nazism is the same thing as driving a truck, wearing a Trump flag, and 
arguing for freedom. You see how this stuff happens? To the left, Nazism, Confederacy is the same thing now as driving a truck and wearing a MAGA hat. Notice how every time you talk to these clowns, these things become more and more specific, more and more linked together. It's like the more they repeat it, the more people believe it. And that certainly is true for progressives who believe this stuff categorically. The fact that there was an incredibly diverse number of drivers, we, we saw the, uh, the interviews, people, all different walks of life, all different backgrounds. There were absolutely almost no negative influences from the people who were driving the trucks. None, zero. In fact, the worst actors at these protests were the Ottawa police themselves who dragged people off by their hair, beat old men in their 70s, late 70s, almost close to death. These were the real fascist actors. Are you a fan of the show? Consider joining the Patriot Club. Your tax-deductible donation of $99 a year keeps us going. Simply visit patriotclub.us. That's patriotclub.us to pledge your support and receive our signature tumbler as a token of our appreciation. We've got much more to come. Stay with us. I just want to remind you that way back there in the summertime, Nature Communications, uh, it's a science journal for all you non sciencey nerds, like I had no idea, but when you say nature communications, you kind of assume. Uh, they published an article that was called An Actionable Anti-Racism Plan for Geoscience Organizations. Hmm, geoscience. Because, you know, geology, obviously, that's racist. So, uh, according to their abstract of said article, geoscience organizations shape the discipline. <sighs> they influence attitudes and expectations, set standards, and provide benefits to their members. Today, Racism and discrimination limit their participation of and promote hostility towards members of minoritized groups within these critical geoscience spaces. This is particularly harmful for black, indigenous, and other people of color in geoscience and is further exacerbated along other axes of marginalization, including disability status and gender identity. Here we present a 20-point anti-racism plan that organizations can implement to build an inclusive, equitable, and accessible geoscience community. Enacting it will combat racism, discrimination, and the harassment of all members. Notice the trope. If there are black people or minorities who don't join certain organizations or pursue certain careers, that's because of racism. Right? I mean, let's be very blunt here. Geology, really? I mean, I could see it if you want to get rich, maybe working for a chemical company or a big oil company. But geology? I mean, come on. Who, who intrinsically finds that exciting? And beside Carrie, Katie, besides our, besides our Katie Petrick, right? But my point to you is, because African Americans aren't flocking to that discipline, it's because of discrimination, and racism? I mean, there are all sorts of things that people don't do. Why are we, and this is, what, this is sci the science is now vying to be the wokest possible cases themselves, right? So uh, the fact that there aren't a lot of black geologists couldn't be that we have to step our, up, up our game and make it more exciting. No, no, it's because the entire white supremacist structure of geology makes it impossible for black and minorities to participate. So for instance, 19 academics chimed in on this article. They say racism thrives in geoscience. Geoscience organizations function along the same racist ideologies and practicing shaping society. Also, racism has led to the geosciences becoming one of the least diverse, uh, diverse among all the science and engineering fears. And, and your only proof for all of these wild, outrageous claims is there just aren't enough in your mind blacks doing it. Yeah, basically. Pretty much. Now, I like geology because I don't like the other sciences. I, I just found rocks fascinating. I, I took geology class. I got an A, of course. You're welcome. But I'm white woman, so I don't know what that means. But I'm yeah, female, so that should be something. Do you remember but the anyway. good old days when it was too few women mm -hmm. in the sciences? And now we got that fixed. You got an A in your geology class. And the fact that you're not black. 
I identify. No. Okay. Means no, anyway, no progress has been made. Uh, we do have the National Association of Scholars, Sciences Project lead researcher, what a title, Christopher San Filippo, who doesn't think that race oriented employment is the answer. What? Race oriented employment is not the answer? Joe Biden, Supreme Court? Mm. Anyway, he said that uh, it spread the spread of this race oriented employment will cripple America's capacity to recruit the best scientists. Fact check true. Instead of bold thinkers, good science requires, we will have ideologues and careerist time servers. Do we have that anywhere else? Anywhere? Yes, we do. Worse, it will drive away foreign students and professors who will have no interest in coming to an American crippled America crippled by requirements to swear allegiance to untruth. Concerns about diversity often seem to eclipse concerns about the actual science itself. These standards for now are still largely meritocratic, but the rationale that underlines a meritocratic system is being chipped away at by, wait for it, <gasps> critical theory. Look, I teach at a university. I see this every day. What happens is you, there's not enough blank in this discipline, not enough women in biology, not enough blacks in geology. So what happens? So you go out of your way to hire somebody in those fields. And what you find is that the only people you can find, the only woman or the only black, is somebody who's less interested in geology or, or, or biology than they are critical race theory. So what happens at universities all the time, you hire these token f people and they're not even interested in their own discipline. They spend their time undermining their own discipline by talking about how racist it is. They ignore geology and, or they create uh, classes, uh, race and geology, right? Feminism and biology, where they don't really talk about race and bio biology. They talk about how racist and sexist the traditional sciences are. And so Mr. Sanfilippo is exactly right. When you go out of your way to diversity, to diversify disciplines who have not really tried to block anybody. I mean, who, do you really think that there are geologists, professors sitting in university campuses, shooing away black students as if geology students are lining up to take full classes? It's not happening. And so what all you're going to do, as Mr. San Filippo says, you'll put people, because you're desperate, you're going to put people of color in those positions who are not interested in science, who are interested in pointing out how racist science is, and that's how you destroy a university. Well, science, you're not alone in being racist. We know grammar's racist. We've known it for a long time. We've reported on it many a time. And here's another doozy from the summer. Again, grammar's racist. Uh, we reported, again, about it all the time and yet here's another example from Towson University specifically where the professors there agree you know what grammar's racist this summer speakers at Towson University's virtual because everything was virtual back then anti-racist pedagogy symposium criticized university writing curriculum and programs for being racist and perpetuating that whiteness how dare they April April Baker Bell, who is an associate professor of language, literacy, and English education at Michigan State University, spoke at this symposium and argued the idea of standard English among teachers is used to maintain racist assumptions about black language. Now, as an English professor, and then for me, as someone who had to take these literacy courses and language courses and talking about, as they put, black language or proper grammar, no matter what we say or what, what actually the truth is, they're just going to come and call it racism. And that's what they've done in this instance. So no matter, even though English professor knows exactly language is for all and someone who's liking of the English language, clearly we're just a bunch of racists. Yeah, Bell stated it is evident. Now, of course, she said it's evident. And once you say it's evident on the left, you don't have to prove it, right? She said that it is evident without evidence that anti-blackness that is used to diminish black language of black students in classrooms is not separate from rampant and deliberate anti-black racism and violence inflicted upon black people in society. So let me see if I got this correct. All American kids, regardless of race, are talking black dialects. The fastest way that the English language is changing in America are the contributions of African Americans. So much slick African American dialogue. All the, remember when in, in the office, Daryl would have racial conversations, helping Michael Scott learn how to speak 
dunk, dink, and flicka, right? All those wonderful phrases of the African-American community. The fastest growing aspect of English language in the West is the contributions of African-Americans. They, our kids all speak it, that language. Our songs, our popular entertainment are full of those kinds of tropes. You see them becoming memes every day. But because when you go to school to learn how to work, to, to write, you're told that there are certain rules like subject, verb, like not, you, uh, not ending sentence and prepositions, teaching kids about punctuation and capitalization. Now all that's racist and violent against black. You see how violent this, uh, ec this emphasis on grammar is. People are getting murdered in the streets, guys, because of all this grammar. Meanwhile, black dialect continues to grow. This is a story looking for a tragedy because they ain't none here. Today's show is sponsored by Clean Start Hand Sanitizer. For an odor-free foam hand sanitizer that lasts two hours and provides 19 refills, visit freedomproject.com slash clean. That's K-L-E-E-N to order yours today. So geology's racist and grammar's racist and oh yeah, your kids are racist. are racist. What? Yep. Uh, kids in the UK are being told that they are not racially innocent. Hmm. Okay. And they're doing this during these classes that are called Racial Literacy 101 sessions. And if they're seven, that's the magic number they picked. If they're about seven years old, that's when now they may not be racially innocent. The Brighton and Hove City Council, which has been accused of indoctrinating children, has said that these classes are required for all staff in schools. And as the Telegraph reported, uh, they said that 300 teachers had done this training, this racial literacy 101 sessions that are being then trained to your own children. And the training is meant to inform specific racial literacy focused lessons for the school kids. <laughs> in documents that were seen by the Telegraph, the course includes reference to covert covert white supremacy not just out there and in the open white supremacy but it's the covert white supremacy which is partially defined during the course is denying your white privilege so if someone says i'm not privileged simply because of the color of my skin oh <laughs> that's that covert white supremacy taking taking place and they also obviously claim that young children are are often seen as racially innocent despite the supposed ample evidence showing that hey this this is simply not the case one of the document states between the ages of three and five children learn to attach value to skin color white at the top of a hierarchy and black at the bottom and so these are seven-year-olds being taught what happens between the third and the fifth grade which is probably inculcated by one and by one and two by parent behavior right what this is is a moving backward to codify every aspect of child development and child behavior and child parenting in particular as adding to racist. This is ultimately down the road. We're not quite there yet. Going to be the argument why parents shouldn't be allowed to have their own kids, while children should not be allowed to grow up in the parental home with this kind of racist inculcation going on. And I love the argument too that you see here. Denying racism, having no evidence of racism in your path, path and, and trumpeting that is itself proof of how racist you actually are. It's Orwellian speak, right? That which there is no proof of and your attempt to prove you. How many times did you beat your wife last night, Senator? Your, uh, and when you argue that you didn't beat her, da, 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 you have seeded the fact that you did. We're only uh, arguing now about how many times. This is how this kind of language works. It is fascist is what they're moving to. It is fascist use of language and it's going to get worse and worse and worse until either we lose all our free freedom or something frees us from this. It's time, it's time for some real education. This week we are showcasing our Presidential Minute series. These short videos are designed and executed with great care to educate adults and children alike on our nation's leaders in 90 seconds or less. Today, we're gonna to take a look at 
Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison. Not who you might have picked for yourself, which is why you need to know more about them. Enjoy. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Grover Cleveland. Born in Caldwell, New Jersey on March 18th, 1837, he would become the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms and therefore the only president to be counted twice. His full name was Stephen Grover Cleveland. However, he never used his first name in his adult life. After declining a full scholarship to becoming a minister, he headed west, where he took an interest in law and eventually started his own practice. His fascination led him to become sheriff of New York where he earned the equivalent of $730,000 by today's standards. A few years later, he became mayor of New York City and governor of New York. In 1884, Grover Cleveland was elected as the nation's 22nd president. Cleveland entered the presidency as a bachelor, but two years later he married Frances Folsom, becoming the only president to have a wedding in the White House. At 21, Frances became the youngest first lady ever and together with Grover raised five children. In 1888, he lost re-election to Benjamin Harrison. However, in 1892, Cleveland was once again elected, now as the 24th president. He is the only Democrat elected to the presidency between 1860 and 1912. On June 24, 1908, Grover Cleveland suffered a heart attack and died at the age of 71. And there you go, a little story about a man named Grover. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Benjamin Harrison. Born in North Bend, Ohio on August 20th, 1833, he would become the only president to be the grandson of a president, William Henry Harrison. He was also the great-grandson of Benjamin Harrison V, one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence. It would seem that he was bred for a life of greatness. At 20, he married Caroline Lavinia Scott and together raised two children. He attended law school and eventually opened his own practice. During the Civil War, he served as a brigadier general and later went on to work in the Senate. In 1888, Benjamin Harrison was elected as the nation's 23rd president. His inauguration took place during a rainstorm and was brief, half the length of his grandfather's, who gave the longest address in presidential history. He was the first president to enjoy electricity at the White House. During his administration, the country's annual budget reached a billion dollars for the first time in history. He also added six states to the Union, more than any president since Washington. Washington. Two weeks before losing re-election, Harrison lost his wife to tuberculosis. On March 13, 1901, Benjamin Harrison died of the flu in Indiana at the age of 67. And there you go, a little story about a man named Ben. I want to take a moment to thank our Patreon Club members for making the videos you just watched and some others possible. Their financial support does provide us the resources to bring these stories to life for all of you there at home to enjoy. If you are not already a member of the Patriot Club, please do consider joining with a $99 gift to support educational videos like the Presidential Minute series. Simply visit PatriotClub.us to get started. That's PatriotClub.us. All right, before we do leave, let's show some love to our Patriot Club members. And today, that very special shout out goes to Dwayne from Valley City, North Dakota. Dwayne, thank you for supporting us. And that wraps up with a tidy bow this show. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. Until next time, we implore you on bended knee, educated, state the.